Major funding for NJ Spotlight News is provided in part by NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years, and by the PSCG Foundation. Tonight on NJ Spotlight News, an imam in Newark is shot and killed, the shooter still at large, and police are not calling it a hate crime. Some in the Islamic community disagree. It feels disingenuous for authorities to jump to the conclusion that there is no bias motivation. The shooting comes as the Murphy administration is touting historic lows in violent crime here in the state. These community-based organizations have helped mediate disputes so they don't spill over into violence. Plus, calls for safer staffing after months of labor strikes and negotiations, Trenton is finally listening. It would take a concept that nurses, um, or at least many nurses in, in labor uh, unions feel is extremely important to patient safety and codify it in law. And um, it, it involves specific ratios for each different units of the hospital. And backing breweries and booze. On the final day of this legislative session, lawmakers attempting a last ditch effort at liquor license reform. I expect it to go through both houses today. I expect it to be on the floor Monday, and I am optimistic that the governor will sign it shortly after that. NJ Spotlight News begins right now. From NJ PBS Studios, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venozzi. Good evening and thanks for joining us on this Thursday night. I'm Brianna Venozzi. The shooting death of a Muslim leader in Newark is sending shockwaves through the community. A day after Imam Hassan Sharif was fatally shot outside a mosque in the city, his killer remains at large and his family is searching for answers. Authorities say they found the imam lying in the parking lot just after pre-dawn prayer with multiple gunshot wounds about 10 feet from the mosque entrance on the corner of South Orange Avenue and Camden Street. Investigators are pouring through security footage and city-owned street cameras to try to get an ID on the shooter. But so far, they say the evidence doesn't indicate the act was motivated by bias or domestic terrorism. Members of the mosque and other Muslims in the community are taking issue with that assessment at a time when most were already on high alert. Ted Goldberg has the latest. It's a deep loss for both Newark as a whole, uh, the black Muslim community, the Muslim community as a whole. It's it's jarring, it's worrying, it's it's horrifying and the community right now is um, is in deep pain and in deep, deep grief and mourning. Muslims in Newark are continuing to pray at Masjid Muhammad Newark one day after their Imam Hassan Sharif was shot and killed just outside their house of worship. Imam Hassan Sharif was uh, a community leader in Newark. He was a father, he was a husband. The impact on the community of this sort of particularly dastardly crime cannot be understated. The investigation hasn't led to any arrests yet and has only amplified fear around religious institutions, despite a vigil last night bringing hundreds of mourners to Newark. All of our religious institutions have been on edge for quite some time. We, along with our partners, have been uh, aggressively patrolling the area, along with Newark and everyone else, every religious institution. Our bomb squad has been very, very busy of late, and we'll continue to make sure that we provide safety for all of our religious institutions. Attorney General Matt Placken ruled out the possibility of a hate crime or domestic terrorism. While we would orderly, ordinarily not go public with this type of information so early in our process, we know and I know that in light of global events and with a rise in bias directed at many communities we're experiencing across our state, but particularly the Muslim community, there are many in New Jersey right now who are feeling a heightened sense of fear or anxiety. CARE New Jersey communications manager Dina Syed Ahmed says it's too soon to rule that out. It feels disingenuous for authorities to jump to the conclusion that there is no bias motivation because it's over 24 hours since the shooting and there still is no suspect in custody. So it's hard to say what the motive is when there's, there's really nothing that the authorities have given us. Whether it is or it isn't, it's an opportunity for us to condemn hate crimes of any kind, whether it's Islamophobia, whether it's anti-Semitism 
or any other hate crimes that have exploded of late. Syed Ahmed says she's also upset at the speculation around the imam's death. The Essex County Prosecutor's Office says he was shot multiple times, but didn't give many more details. Within hours, we've been seeing headlines um, saying that the that there is no bias motivation, that, um, you know, others saying that, oh, it's just another day of violence in Newark, uh, which is very dismissive. And we're calling on authorities to do their due diligence and to investigate this uh, incident thoroughly and to ensure that the imam and his community do receive justice. Leaders say New Jersey's houses of worship will continue seeing more police, as they have since the Israel-Hamas war started back in October. There's a reward for anyone who gives information leading to closing this case. Essex County Crime Stoppers is offering $25,000 for info leading to an arrest, while Care New Jersey has put up $10,000 for info leading to an arrest and conviction. In Newark, I'm Ted Goldberg, NJ Spotlight News. Imam Sharif's tragic death comes as state leaders today also announced a significant milestone in public safety, unveiling data showing a historic low in gun violence for 2023 across New Jersey, with the fewest shooting victims recorded since the state began tracking it 15 years ago. According to state police statistics, 924 individuals were shot in New Jersey last year. That's down 13 percent from a year prior. And the first time the number of shooting victims is under 1,000 since 2009. Homicides also declined down 8 percent over the previous year. Governor Murphy, Attorney General Matt Platkin and State Police Colonel Pat Callahan today also pointed to data showing shooting victims declined in New Jersey's largest cities, including Trenton. In Newark, Atlantic City, and Patterson, where the Attorney General's office took control of the police department last March. Officials touted community violence intervention programs and reduction task forces for the progress. These community-based organizations have helped mediate disputes so they don't spill over into violence. And they have provided thoughtful, compassionate support to survivors of gun violence. And in doing so, they have proven that a community-oriented strategy is the most effective way to address the roots of gun violence and make our city safer for everyone. Well, during that same press conference today, the governor offered an update on the migrant crisis. As of 8 a.m., 26 buses carrying roughly 1,200 migrants from Texas arrived or passed through locations in New Jersey just since this weekend. Governor Murphy says most have continued on to New York City, but believes a few dozen have been picked up by family members in New Jersey, stopping off at train stations in Edison, Trenton, Secaucus, and elsewhere, all in an effort to circumvent circumvent a New York order restricting their arrivals. The administration is in communication with officials in New York, and Governor Murphy is now calling on Congress to take action on immigration reform. Representative Bonnie Watson Coleman earlier today sent a letter to Murphy's office signed by several of her Democratic colleagues pledging to work together on a solution, but also requesting information about whether the governor knew ahead of time that migrants would be coming through the state. The lame duck legislative session is coming to a close, and that means lawmakers have little time to button up final bills and other proposals they want moved before it's over. The roughly two-month-long period following November's general election has been chaotic in Trenton, with dozens of measures introduced and committees moving at a breakneck pace to approve them. As senior political correspondent David Cruz reports, it's a time when transparency tends to take a back seat to a expediency. You might think that a legislative session that began almost a year ago would have had its ducks in a row enough to finish cleanly. But, you know, it's New Jersey, and if there's a last minute left on the clock, lawmakers will take it. So bills on affordable housing reform, changes to liquor license laws, and yes, salary increases, aka the complicated ones, are being rushed onto or pulled from the agenda. When you approached me, David, I was reviewing the comments on the revised liquor license reforms, and you know, it appears at first glance, and I'm happy with them. I just wish I had the comments yesterday, or maybe even the day before, so that I could have reviewed them. Republicans were forced to sit around and wait for the majority party to hammer out details on bills which need to get committee reviews before they can get a vote 
at Monday's final session of the year. But they'll raise their voices in front of any of us who'll listen, like on a bill up for committee consideration that would raise salaries for the governor and his cabinet and lawmakers. Bottom line is, we don't deserve them. There's no chance we should get uh, salary raises for state legislators. There are 443 different jobs in the state of New Jersey, if you don't know this, U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, that make less than the amount of money they want to make, have us make for a part-time job. Yeah. It's ludicrous. It's a, it's, a, it's a poor use of public funds. Lobbyists and advocates waited patiently in State House Annex meeting rooms as discussions and deals were had and made in caucus rooms. Affordable housing reform, which would kill the Council on Affordable Housing and create special regional masters to assess affordable housing needs, was announced with great fanfare. Except now, not so much. In my opinion, that needs a little more work, okay? Uh, I've gotten calls from uh, constituents in my district, in my, in actually in my town, who say they have an issue with it. It's, it's detrimental to the city of Inglewood. So uh, I have a problem with that bill. Right now, it's on the agenda. Um, I'm not sure where the discussions are between the two houses. Um, uh, you know, and I think that that's still being worked through. So I guess we'll see what the Senate does, but it is on the agenda for consideration by this committee today. Um, and it's uh, wh where the discussions are at this moment in time are, are above my, right. my pay grade. Right. So. The much talked about and still being wrestled with bill that would help small breweries who want to be able to expand their offerings but are caught in a fight over expanding the number of liquor licenses in the state appears to have found some compromise, according to the sponsor. It does a lot on... Uh, easing restrictions on breweries, um, uh, whether it's events, ability to contract with food vendors, um, everything they're doing uh, from trivia nights to to having food trucks, it's going to make it much easier as small businesses to operate. The larger fish to fry, allowing for the creation of more liquor licenses around the state, will not be a major feature of this bill, which, like some others we've mentioned here, will probably make it out of today's committee meetings, but then again... Might not. We'll have to see when the session officially comes to an end on Monday. I'm David Cruz, NJ Spotlight News. An issue that's been at the center of massive nursing strikes in the state is finally getting taken up in the legislature. Lawmakers today heard testimony on a controversial bill that'll set limits for nurse to patient ratios. The proposal was first introduced 16 years ago and would codify into law how many patients a nurse can care for at most medical centers in the state. Many nurses unions are backing the legislation as essential for protecting both workers and patients. But as healthcare writer Lilo Stainton tells us, hospitals fear it's an impossible standard to meet. She joins me with the latest. Lilo, this is an issue that has been in the spotlight um, really because of these strikes that have been going on. But what's the proposal that legislators are considering today? What are the nuts and bolts of it? Right. So the nuts and bolts are it would take a concept that nurses, um, or at least many nurses in, in labor, uh, unions feel is extremely important to patient safety and codify it in law. And um, it, it involves specific ratios for each different units of the hospital. And in this case, in this legislation, also um, behavioral health facilities, um, state hospitals, all kinds of places, include also ambulatory care, so outpatient care. Um, and, and literally put down in the law, you know, you need one to one in this situation, anesthesia, you need one to two in neonatal um, care, you need one to five in med surge, which is your general hospital, and so on and so forth. So considering uh, the fact that this has been on an argument for many years and, of course, reached a peak during the pandemic and after, nursing homes are now being held to this standard, why are lawmakers just now considering this bill? Right. So like you say, this has been around as long as I've been doing this work, um, <laughs> almost. Um, you know, the bill goes back to at least 2008. Um, but there has been, you know, always this pushback from the hospital industry or nursing home industry that, you know, we can't afford this. And it, and it's impossible also because there's always a shortage of nurses. And that's a real concern. 
Um, what's bringing it to the forefront now is, I think, the strikes. I mean, I spoke to Senator Vitale, or Vitale earlier today, and he said, you know, that really did put a, a spotlight on this, or others have said. Um, and, you know, he also said that it showed that while the bill is not up for a vote today, it's just up for discussion, Vitale said to me, it shows that there is a possible way to do this, right? Um, the, one of the, the key points that that strike was settled over um, was a staffing agreement that apparently is codified somehow in the contract and has, you know, a P, the nurses are comfortable with it, they're pleased with it, the hospital is willing to do it. So Vitaly's point is there is a way forward here. There is, it may not look exactly like this for all hospitals, but they showed this being a major, major hospital in central New Jersey, they showed this is possible. Well, you mentioned that some hospitals have been against it, but also, correct me if I'm wrong, there have been some nurses unions that have yep. said, you know, we need some flexibility here when staffing is needed in other departments. We we don't want to be held to these numbers. Also, there are, you know, folks with seniority who can handle more patients than, say, a junior nurse. Yes, there is that argument, and, and it is true. Not all nurses are on board with this concept. Um, it, you know, it is it is definitely there is a question of how do you rank people. Then there, but then there is the pushback: is well, hospitals or you know the institutions tend to count people who are essentially doing secretarial or other administrative duties, and you know, as a nurse, when that person may have a degree but isn't functioning as a nurse. So, you know, the point is, if everybody did this the way they should, we wouldn't need the law. I guess is the argument. Um, yeah. So here we are. You know, will it will it get a vote soon? Um, I think that's still TBD, but it'll be an interesting discussion for and sure. And a problem that's not going away for sure. Yeah. Lilo Stainton, thank you so much. Thanks, Bree. As Governor Murphy noted today, community violence intervention programs are proving to be effective tools in reducing crime. Now, a number of those organizations are gearing up to share a pot of new funding being made available through a fund created within New Jersey's recreational cannabis industry to reinvest in the communities most in need. Melissa Rose Cooper reports. A lot of us out here, like, you know, we was born and raised in North, we're from the community. Prime example, we have community health care workers that are a part of HFIP. They either suffer from the violence, interpersonal violence, or they, you know, we was raised in the community. So I feel as though, like, you know, we can be able to give back to the community and help them because, you know, when people come in, we're meeting them at their best side, their most vulnerable moment. Which is why Najla Sharif of Newark Community Street Team says its hospital violence intervention program with University Hospital is a much needed initiative. Healthcare workers partner up with community advocates in an effort to reduce crime by providing various crisis intervention assistance for victims and their families, including counseling, conflict mediation, and and access to social services. Sharif knows firsthand the impact a program like this can make, having lost her son's father to gun violence. It made me feel like I needed to put more effort and more, like I wanted to help the community because I felt like if we had this program around when he was alive, I felt like he would still be here. The program is one of nearly a dozen across New Jersey set to share $5.2 million in state funding to assist with crime reduction. The money will come from the Cannabis Regulatory Enforcement Assistance Marketplace Modernization Fund, which reinvests in communities most affected by the criminalization of marijuana. This reinvestment is going to you know, directly make this state healthier and, and sustainable. So I think that's really something that uh, New, New Jersey's pioneering on as far as like, you know, being able to um, you know, identify you know, what many felt that you know, like had you know, really made um, you know, many people in our community vulnerable and entering the, the justice system to kind of like refranchise them, give them, restore their rights and then also reinvesting in the communities that's going to have a long-term impact. Positive impact Shirelli Patel of Blaze Responsibly is helping clients achieve. So we've done expungements throughout the state of New Jersey, helped over 800 people last year with free legal services. And we also do a lot of free education for the community that's done through social media and online presence. But while the cannabis industry is providing more opportunities for residents, Patel says there are still some concerns. The reality of not having access to traditional banking and capital is what leads to a lot of issues that we're seeing right now because real estate is tight. 
So when you add the fact that municipalities get to opt in and create their own zones, you're already restricting the areas where they can operate out of. And then if you don't have the capital to acquire that real estate, you're kind of out of luck. But she's optimistic things will improve. Dr. Colette Adams believes the reinvestment of cannabis funding for hospital-based violence intervention programs is another step in the right direction. We are pleased that we're refunded for another cycle, for another program year. And what that means for us is that we get to continue this great work. This hospital and other hospitals that have been awarded, um, it, it, it's an expensive undertaking to employ an entire team that is focused completely, really focused. Com imagine a team that is focused completely on working with individuals in the, who've come to the hospital who are victims of crime. This funding allows us to keep that going. Positive signs, the cannabis industry is helping to keep people off the streets and trying to save more lives. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Melissa Rose Cooper. In our Spotlight on Business report, the so-called Santa Claus rally to start the new year never happened. Wall Street is trying to shake off a rough start to 2024 with stocks opening higher. Here's today's closing trading numbers. Tune in this weekend to NJ Business Beat with Raven Santana. She focuses on your financial health in the new year, from getting a hold of your debt to building your savings now and for retirement. Watch it on the NJ Spotlight News YouTube channel Saturday at 10 a.m. the most endangered mammals in the world, but New Jersey Congressman Frank Pallone says there is a way to save North Atlantic right whales, which are on the brink of extinction thanks to human activity. Pallone is demanding the U.S. Coast Guard and other federal agencies enforce speeding restrictions on large shipping vessels. According to federal data, fast-moving vessel strikes and entanglements are responsible for three-quarters of whale deaths and injuries, but no one is stopping them from breaking speeding laws. Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan reports. Boats are speeding and whales are dying. It's just that simple. Advocates for North Atlantic right whales issued a dire warning. The slow moving behemoths swimming in busy shipping lanes too often end up as hit and run victims, killed by massive cargo ships that often violate seasonal go slow zones in red on the map. Some 86% of big cargo vessels using the ports of New York and New Jersey exceed the 11 mile per hour mandatory speed limit established by NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, according to a recent study. Even one human caused death is too many for this population to sustain. If NOAA wants to save the species from extinctions, from extinction, ships must slow down when these whales are present and speeding boats must be held accountable. We see marine mammals washing ashore along the East Coast and even the entire country, most of them with clear evidence of propeller marks and injuries of severe skull damage and internal bleeding. We must actually do the work to crack down and enforce the vessel speed rule. The idea that they just issue the rule and don't enforce it is totally unacceptable to me. Congressman Frank Pallone says the Coast Guards told him they need more resources to enforce the whale safety speed limit. NOAA reports it's pursued just 56 civil cases worth about a million dollars in fines over the past two years. A frustrated Pallone today fired off a letter to both agencies demanding they aggressively expand and existing enforcement efforts to ensure compliance with the rule and deter future violators. As you know, if you have a rule and you find out that nobody's enforcing it, it doesn't have any deterrent effect. It's basically a speeding ticket. Animal welfare advocate Greg Riley served in the Coast Guard. He credits NOAA, which didn't reply to our request for comment, for proposing stricter rules. But Riley says both agencies need to take stronger action. And I know firsthand that even uh, small amounts of enforcement, um, even small tickets, 
cause changes in behavior. Can you spot the red dot? It shows a satellite tagged whale migrating north. Collisions have increased as climate change draws in whales who followed their food fish closer to shore. Since 2017, more than 120 whales have died, most of them after ship strikes and entanglements. Only 340 North Atlantic right whales remain, including just 70 breeding females. But when those mother calf pairs are in the water, uh, they are especially susceptible to vessel strikes. Uh, they spend a lot of time at or near the surface, um, and, uh, and that's exactly where the strikes happen. It's time to ensure that we don't have lawbreakers off the Jersey Shore that are recklessly speedy. Pallone says NOAA got $82 million in federal infrastructure funding this past summer. He urged the agency and the Coast Guard to spend more on speed enforcement. In Long Branch, I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJ Spotlight News. And that's going to do it for us tonight. But don't forget to download the NJ Spotlight News podcast so you can listen anytime. I'm Brianna Venozzi for the entire NJ Spotlight News team. Thanks for being with us. We'll see you right back here tomorrow night. New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. And RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. NJM Insurance Group has been part of New Jersey for over a century. We support our communities through NJM's corporate giving program, supporting arts and culture related and nonprofit organizations that serve to improve the lives of children, rebuild communities, and help to create a new generation of safe drivers. We're proud to be part of New Jersey. NJM, we've got New Jersey covered.